There we go. Good morning. It's great to welcome you to First Presbyterian Church today. Jeremy's going to have a little announcement about a slight change up in the music, and they're going to join in singing with you on this? I sure hope so. Okay, tell them about it. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. In your bulletin, we were supposed to start with Broken Vessels, but Lindsay is ill today, and I wasn't about to tackle that one. So we are going to do Chris Tomlin's Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, similar theme, and you might even recognize this one. So the uh, lyrics will be up on the screen, and we hope you'll join us in song. sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains It is great having you in God's house with, with us today, and we're glad you joined us virtually also. Wherever you are, I hope you feel a part of the community of faith. Let's now stand and introduce ourselves to one another in Christ's love. Thank you. 
as you make your way back to your pew, you'll probably find the ritual of friendship, Pat, or one end or the other. We'd love to know that you were with us today, so I hope you'll take a moment, sign that, and pass that down so others will have the opportunity to. Sure, looking at the bulletin, looking at the tower chimes, well, the bulletin, the slides, or the tower chimes, you'll see that fall programming is returning here at the church. Youth group, middle school, and high school, they are back in session. Morning Out Mom is back. Our choirs are back. September is right around the corner, and we will see Christ Kids, Fun Timers, Saturday Night Live, and Sunday School, all those different things. I forgot to mention Men's Lunch. They're meeting right now on Tuesdays. The PW Circles are coming back in September. So watch for the activities, and we hope you'll join us in the life of the church, in study, in fellowship, and in service. Yesterday, we had our Saturday soup kitchen, and the head cook was Richard Elmore. Richard had three ladies from Hearst Chapel AME Church join him. That was Yvonne, Mona, and Anne. Also, Dana Elmore and Vondrasic and Margaret Braun. And they report that baked ziti, coleslaw, garlic bread, all the Publix desserts were enjoyed by 96 diners yesterday. So, again, because of what we're able to do together, 96 people did not go to bed hungry last night in Winter Haven. Upcoming, this coming weekend is the holiday weekend, and Amanda Joe and David Nicholson have signed up to head cook there, and they are recruiting their crew, so they said they think they've got their group. September 9 and September 16 are open for head cooks and helpers right now, and then we're going to have our friends from St. John's United Methodist take a Sunday, or a Saturday, and also Hope Presbyterian is on for a couple Saturdays coming up. So, wonderful things are happening. If you would like to make a difference in the world, the Saturday Soup Kitchen is a wonderful place to show up. So 9th and 16th, I thank everybody for the past and for the future sign-up dates. Um, we're just praising God together. Tonight, The Chosen is back. So our Chosen Bible Study is back. Um, the new season doesn't drop until, I think, January. So we're looking back at seasons 1, 2, 3. We're also looking at some of the work that was done in the Bible studies before The Chosen was filmed. So come out tonight and join us. We'll have a great conversation around the table about the theme, The Chosen. We'd love to have you be with us. It's covered dish at 5.30. We run till 7, and we do have child care available. So come out for some good fellowship and friendship around The Chosen. I'd like you to continue worshiping with us, so let's turn in our hymn books now to hymn 35. Stand if you're physically able. Let's praise God together with Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty.
confessing those sins together. Merciful God, in your covenant love, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. This morning, we confess our sins and ask your mercy. We realize that we have not always loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as we love ourselves. We have often not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you. As a perfect and patient God, we ask you to have mercy on your creation, forgiving our sinful ways, and training us for faithful living through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Merciful God, embody that mercy for us. This day we pray. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ends. When we call out to God, God answers. God saves us with a strong and outstretched hand. Be at peace, for it is in Christ Jesus that you, we, are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the children who are with us to join me down front for our time with younger disciples. about to wrap up the summer and so this may be the last good news for God's children for a time. Found a book that I hadn't known before this week and it's part of actually something called the food group. So you're going to hear much more in the years to come. Today's called the bad seed. There's also the sour grape. There's the smart cookie and a whole bunch of others. But how many of you know the bad seed? Just a few of you. Well, this is called The Bad Seed. It was written by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald. So let's get to meet The Bad Seed. I love the cover. What's he holding in his hand? You think he's going to do some nice things with a crayon? Maybe not. Remember, he's a bad seed. I'm a bad seed. I'm a bad seed. Oh, yeah, it's true. The other seeds, they look at me and they say, oh, that seed is so bad. When they think I'm not listening, they mumble. There goes a bad seed. But I can hear them. I have good hearing for a seed. How bad am I? How bad do you think he is? What are some bad things you think this seed might do? He had his crayon, so he might draw everywhere. What else might he do that's bad? <gasps> Winston, you told me you know this book. You're right, he skips the line. Is that bad? Yeah, well, let's just see how bad he is. Well, I never put things back where they belong. Do you or your parents take the shopping cart back to the shopping cart corral, or do you leave it out in the middle of the parking lot to dent Dr. Negley's truck? <laughs> I don't do that. I never put things back where they belong. I'm late to everything. 
is that bad? I tell long jokes with no punchlines. <laughs> is that bad? I never wash my hands or my feet. Ooh. Is that bad? I lie about pointless stuff. Now look closely at that picture. There is a baseball that went through a window and the bad seed is holding a baseball bat and pointing to the cat like the cat broke that window. I don't think so. And, Winston, you're right, I cut in line every time. Is that bad? Yeah, that's bad. I stare at everybody. I glare at everybody. Look what he's doing to that baby in the stroller. I finish everybody's sentences and I never listen. And you know what is the baddest of all the bad things? He's in the library here and it says, quiet please. And what's he doing? He's banging on some drums in a library. Wow, I'm a bad seed. Do you think he was always that way? He says, I just can't help it. Sure, I wasn't always this bad. I was born a humble seed on a simple sunflower in an unremarkable field. Have you ever seen a sunflower grow? They're big, pretty flowers, and they're full of seeds. I had a big family, he says. Seeds everywhere. We found ways of having fun. We were close. Look at his seed family. They're playing instruments. They're reading books. They're smiling. You see, it was good. But then the petals dropped and our flower drooped. What's happening? All the seeds are falling to the ground. It's kind of a blur. They raked up all the seeds. I remember a bag, he says. Somebody who can read, tell me what that says. What does that say, Kelly? Sunflower seeds, delicious. What's gonna happen to the seed? What's going to happen? Yeah, he says, I remember a bag. Everything went dark. And then, then, a giant was about to eat him. I thought I was a goner. I thought I was done for. I screamed and hollered, oh! But I was spit out at the last possible second. <laughs> That's written right there. I flew through the air and landed underneath the bleachers with a huge thud. When I woke up it was dark outside. A wad of gum had softened my fall. I felt okay but something had changed in me. I'd become a different seed entirely. I had become a bad seed. A bad seed. Let's see what he does. I stopped smiling. I kept to myself and I drifted. I was a friend to nobody and bad to everybody. I was lost on purpose. I lived inside a soda can. I didn't care. It suited me. Does that seem like a good life for a seed? No. He was a bad seed until recently. Huh, he's looking in the mirror. What do you think? Recently, I made a big decision. I've decided I don't want to be a bad seed anymore. I'm ready to be happy. It's hard to be good when you're so used to being bad, but I'm trying. I'm taking it one day at a time. Let's see what he does to be a good seed. He says, sure, I still forget to listen. Do you ever forget to listen to people? 
I still show up late. Are you ever late sometimes? And I still talk during the movies. Do you ever do that? I do all kinds of other bad stuff. But I also say thank you. Have you said thank you lately? I say please. Do you ever say please? And I smile. Do you ever smile? And I hold the doors open for people. Do you ever do that? Not always, but sometimes. And even though I still feel bad sometimes, I also feel kind of good. It's sort of a mix. And I can, all I can do is keep trying and keep thinking. Maybe I'm not such a bad seed after all. Do you think he might be a good seed too? Well, let's see what the other seeds think. Hey, look, there goes that bad seed. That's what everybody always said about him. Actually, he's not all that bad anymore. And look what he says when he turns around with a smile. I heard that. The bad seed. Well, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what other bad things you do. Well, that's true. It's kind of a sad life there. Well, in a little bit, I'm going to read something by a guy named Paul. And you may have heard him called Saint Paul in your life. But actually, we're going to read something from Romans where I think I heard Paul say, I'm a bad seed. So I want you to listen for that or ask anybody who stays in during the sermon to listen. And see where we all fit on the bad seed scale, okay? Well, like I said, I enjoyed this book when I came across it. Pretty soon I'm going to have the whole food group, so I promise you some other food stories. And hopefully we'll hear something today that makes sense to all of us. Well, let's fold our hands. Can we do that? Let's bow our heads and let's talk to God in prayer. God, we thank you that you made us who we are. We thank you for the lives we go through. We thank you for the times when we can help other people. We thank you for loving us at all times, though. Help us to listen to your word today and hear how you view us. And maybe we're not such bad seeds after all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming today and thanks for coming down to help me. God indeed has given us gifts to share, prophetic acts and acts of service, teaching and leading, encouragement, (coughs) diligence and cheerfulness, giving without strings attached. Freely then we open our hearts, hands and resources to a world and need and the furthering of God's kingdom in our world. This morning's offering will now be received.
Gracious God, we thank you for the measure of faith you have given to each of us. Increase in us generosity, compassion, and prophetic courage so that we may continue to be your body in and for the world. With thanksgiving, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Continuing with that spirit of prayer, will you pray with me as we offer our prayers as God's people this morning? O oh, Eternal One, we bow before you this morning aware of the beauty that surrounds us with adoration, wonder, and awe. We experience great wonder whenever we ponder life in your creation. Yet we also stand in silent trepidation as we take in the sheer force and destruction that can come from natural disasters. And this morning we are especially mindful of those communities and lands affected by such natural disasters. As the water rises, the fires blaze, and that unceasing heat wreaks their vengeance across our country or around the world, we are again humbled by our utter dependence on you. And so we pray for our world, groaning with lament, war, and suffering. We lament with those communities when violence overshadows their days. May their heartache and soul searching for answers touch us as well to be a helping hand. Save us, gracious Lord. Redeem us, O Lord. Grow our hearts so large that we might make room for those who struggle, those who stray, and those who have lost their ways. Help us to embrace one another as created ones in your image. May we truly be disciples of Christ. We also pray this morning that you will be with those who must carry the horrors of war or who live with the scars of what they have witnessed or what they are called upon to do. We especially pray for our active military, our Coast Guard, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Army. Be with those innocent victims. Be with the injured, the suffering, the grieving. Be with the families of those who loved ones serve our country with freedom and bravery it requires. We offer prayers for those who help, our emergency responders, police and firefighters, as well as all those who assist in making a community whole again. We also pray for you to be with leadership so that they may lead it to the ways of peace. Gracious Lord, all the earth cries out for your shalom. Holy Spirit, we pray to feel your powerful healing presence within our communities, within our church, within ourselves. As your people, we lift to you those whose concerns, guilts, illnesses, or addictions rule their lives. We lift to you those who are wrapped in the pain of grief. And so we ask, spirit of gentleness, wrap your protective arms around us and them, so, to, so as to cause the wind and the storms of life to be calmed. Allow our compassion to transform us and renew our minds, hearts, and spirits, so that we may truly discern your will and your way. Cause us to be strong in faith, loyal in service, patient in hope. This prayer we pray together, saying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture lessons for today come to us in the New Testament letter called Romans. I invite you to turn in the Bible that you may have brought from home or the Bible that you'll find in the pew. Our reading today begins in Romans chapter 3 with a single verse. I'm reading today from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen now for God's word. 
since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then turning to Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I do. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have two questions for each of us this morning. Question number one, where do you rate yourself on the goodness scale? Now to help you with that, on a scale of one to 10 with one being a no count so-and-so and and 10 being an absolute angel, where do you place yourself on the goodness scale? Please keep that number to yourself. Now, number two, in terms of your behavior, your words and your actions, what percentage of the time are you perfect? Now, based on your response to those two questions, here's a follow-up. Do either of these statements that we read today from two different sources ring true to you? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God for the very things I hate I end up doing? Or... I'm a bad seed. (laughs) Friends, just how far from perfect do each of us find ourselves in our daily lives? When we first met our food friend this morning, he told us flat out that he was a bad seed. The other things thought it, and they even said it out loud, and he himself told us how bad he really was leaving the grocery cart out in the middle of a parking lot, playing drums in the library, not washing his hands or his feet, telling lies, and of course the one that Winston must have related to because it is really bad, cutting in line all the time. He told us he was a bad seed. He explained how this transition had happened in his past, and as we watched what he did, I think we all agreed. He was a bad seed. But then, before we just point a finger, if we think about what we do in our lives, staring at people, glaring at people and more, we might have to acknowledge that we too are a little or a long way from perfect. That's the human condition. Over the years, I have wondered about my own life in faith, and as I have read through the Bible more than once, I have been drawn to some of the words of Paul. Let's think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, the great giant in the faith. How many places do you go where you see some place called St. Paul's? Well, in writing his most detailed theological tome to the Christians who lived in Rome, he described all of us, himself included, as bad seeds. If you sit down and read the book of Romans, you'll go through two chapters early on, reflections on God's written law and God's natural law. It explains how we have been told and shown in the word itself and in nature how to live our lives. And then Paul comes to the point of saying in Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 9, what then? Are we any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin, as it is written. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are their paths, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. 
Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human will be justified before God by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here in Romans chapter 3, Paul, like that bad seed, tells us how it might have happened. The law of God defines our sinful ways. The law of God holds up a mirror in front of us and exposes our disobedient behavior. That's the human condition. That's the inner conflict. Later in Romans chapter 7, we get a little more detail. We know that the law is spiritual, Paul writes, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but it is, in fact, no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells within me. For I know that the good does not dwell within me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do good lies close at hand, but not the ability. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war within the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we read Paul's words to the Romans and think about faith, the question is posed to all of us. Are we good seeds or bad seeds? The answer is yes. We can know what is right, and sometimes we can do it, But we are far from being perfect. When Paul was writing another letter, this one to the church in Galatia, he seemed to sound the same tone. Talking about this inner conflict, this struggle for Christians between flesh and spirit, Paul shared these words in Galatians chapter 3. Beginning with verse 16, he says, Live by the Spirit. I say, do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There again is the inner conflict, the human condition. 
So was Paul the only person to know that struggle? Was Paul the only biblical character to wrestle with behaviors and always wonder about his actions, struggling to do what is right, but not always achieving that? Is Paul the only person of faith that we have known in our lives who ranks near we may rank ourselves on the goodness scale? Near the middle? Maybe below? Is Paul the only person who was at once called by God and then find themselves far from being perfect? No. If we just think of some of our other friends from the Bible, we know Paul was not alone. Think about a guy named David. David was a shepherd boy who slew a Philistine giant named Goliath. And in that, he defended God's people and God's honor. David, the young boy, was pretty soon anointed king over God's people. And it was King David who committed adultery and plotted and executed a murder. And as David continued to lead God's people, he danced and praised to God. And he wrote many of the Psalms, that book that we call our Holy Scriptures. Friends, it seems to me that faith is more circular or spiral than it is linear. Just when we think we're coming to the point that we're closing in on perfection, we usually miss that mark and then spiral back around. Think about the story of Peter. Simon Peter, the fisherman, heard the call of Jesus and left everything to follow Jesus. On the road of discipleship, Peter is often listed with James and John in the inner circle. One day, Peter himself was promised by God, Jesus, that Peter would become the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. Peter would hold the keys to the kingdom. And it was after that pronouncement that Peter walked away from Jesus on the night of his arrest, denying three times that he even knew our Lord. Faithfulness can be a close, then distant, then close again adventure. Paul's words to the Romans seemed to be a confession of his own weakness and a description of the lives of these other faithful witnesses as well as the story of a random sunflower seed. Was that flunt sunflower seed a bad seed? Maybe. Was he a good seed? Maybe. All rolled into one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do. The very things I hate I end up doing. It may just be that when we are far from being perfect, that we really come to understand that faith is about following and receiving God's grace and accepting God's love. It's about a lifetime journey of following Christ and keeping our eyes on God when we decide that we want something better. You know, sometimes on the life journey, I stop to read bumper stickers. There are two that came to mind this week when I was wrestling with Paul's words. One of them says, the church is not a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. The other one says, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Sometimes on the faith journey, I also depend on songs. I wonder if this Christian named John Newton was reflecting on some of Paul's words when he wrote that much-beloved hymn, Amazing Grace. I wonder if this was going around in Newton's heads when he sat down to compose that hymn. I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. John Newton's story is one of those that's often told. He's the man who wrote Amazing Grace. We're reminded he was once the captain of a slave trading ship. He had a conversion experience, a change of heart, and he became an Anglican minister and hymn writer. That's the short version of his bio. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I've told that short version many times over. But do we know the full story of this wretch, John Newton? This week, I happened upon his bio in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Newton was born to a devout nonconformist mother and a father who was a merchant or who was a merchant ship captain. His mother died of tuberculosis when Newton was almost seven years old, and by the age of 11, he was accompanying his father on sea voyages. At the age of 18, he was pressed into service with the Royal Navy. After attempting to desert, he was relieved of his post and sent aboard a passing slave vessel attracted to the transatlantic slave trade as, quote, an easy and creditable way of life, end quote, Newton later served as a sailor aboard several ships involved in it. Although the Christian instruction from his mother stayed with him, Newton had largely abandoned the religion of his childhood until March 10, 1748, when he felt the first stirrings of a renewal of faith in God while steering a near-foundering ship through a fierce storm. Each subsequent year for the rest of his life, he observed the date of his, quote, conversion with prayer. Seeing no conflict between his burgeoning faith and his employment, Newton, Newton continued working as a trader of enslaved persons and captained three voyages trafficking captive slaves to the West Indies between 1750 and 1754. In 1754, poor health forced him to find a new occupation. Back on land, Newton naturally gravitated toward a religious profession and became an ordained Church of England clergyman in 1764. He accepted a post as curate at a church in Olney, Buckinghamshire. In 1767, the poet William Cowper settled in Olney, and he and Newton began a friendship that lasted until Cowper's death. Together they wrote the Olney Hymns, published in 1779, which contains 68 hymns by Cowper and 280 hymns by Newton. Among, among Newton's most memorable contributions were Amazing Grace, and glorious things of thee are spoken. As his faith matured, Newton's remorse over his involvement in the slave trade surfaced and galvanized him. In 1785, he met with William Wilberforce and counseled him to remain in politics rather than pursue a religious life. Newton would remain a spiritual mentor for this prominent abolitionist for the next 20 years. In 1787, Newton helped Wilberforce found the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, more commonly called the Anti-Slavery Society. The following year, Newton wrote Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade, a graphic account of his experiences aboard slave ships that included a repentant confession of his personal involvement in the trade. His pamphlet sold out immediately and the second edition was sent to every member of Parliament. Newton would go on to testify against slavery at parliamentary hearings and even spoke on the issue at a meeting of the Privy Council. He continued to preach until his death, though in the last years of his life he went blind and became increasingly feeble. He died nine months after Parliament abolished the slave trade in the British Empire. The childhood seeds of Newton's faith sprouted as he piloted a ship through a storm, but he kept on in that trade until his health failed. Gradually, this self-proclaimed wretch 
move beyond that profession to become a preacher and an abolitionist. Paul's words to the Romans may have described not only Paul's own life, but also John Newton's journey and inspired it. If they had lived a lot later, Paul and John Newton might have dared to echo the words of a sunflower seed in another book. I've made a big decision. I've decided I don't want to be a bad seed anymore. I'm ready to be happy. I'm taking it one day at a time. Sure, I still forget to listen and I still talk during movies, but I also say thank you and I say please and I smile sometimes. Even though I still feel bad sometimes, I also feel kind of good. It's sort of a mix. All I can do is keep trying and keep thinking. Maybe I'm not such a bad seed after all. Friends, I have two questions for us this morning. One, where do you rate yourself on the goodness scale? One to ten, with one being a no-count so-and-so and and ten being an absolute angel, where do you place yourself on that scale? And in terms of your daily behavior, what percentage of the time are you perfect? So, are you a bad seed? Are you a good seed? Or are you just an ordinary seed who's trying to live in the grace of God? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's hold that promise and keep on living. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now join together with the praise band as we praise God with our closing song, What Mercy Did For Me.
Thank you, praise band and congregation. In the announcement this morning, I had one thing in the right column, and I didn't see that, but it's a very important announcement. September 10th at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a recital here in the sanctuary, piano and organ featuring Jeremy Rath, and I hope you'll come out and join us for that. And the postlude today is just a little teaser from that recital. It's Take Off on Amazing Grace, and I appreciate Jeremy working on that Takata for us today, a little bit ahead of the recital. Friends, we are called by God to be faithful followers, but faithfulness is a tricky path. There are some days that we may feel we are on top of the world in our faith, and like Paul in his boasting moments, we may dare to tell people about it. There may be other times that, like Paul, will say, the very things I hate, I end up doing. I hope the grace of God covers me in that time. So go out and live in the grace that's given to you. Live your faith boldly. Invite others to follow you on the journey. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with all of us now and forevermore. Amen.